the assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Felix Antoine Chilombo Tshisekedi, President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Felix Antoine Chilombo Tshisekedi, President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, to invite him to address the General Assembly. Monsieur le Président de Mr. President of the United Nations General Assembly, Mr. Secretary General of the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, heads of state and government, ladies and gentlemen, heads of delegation, it is a great honor and a genuine pleasure for me to take the floor from this rostrum to ensure that the voice of my country, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, is heard on the primary questions occupying the international community at present. Mr. President, I would nevertheless, at the outset, like to congratulate you on your election to the presidency of the 77th session of the United Nations General Assembly. I am convinced that you will do your best to ensure the success of this session, and I would like to ensure you that, assure you that you have my country's full support. Mr. President, the major challenges facing humanity at the moment are the following. Peace and security for all. Controlling climate change. Relaunching the global economy post-COVID-19. Combating poverty and promoting collective well being. These major challenges are complex and intimately interlocking. Aware of this reality, I commend the very judicious choice and the relevance of the theme of this session a watershed moment, transformative solutions to interlocking challenges. Clearly, overcoming these challenges will require working greater in concert, will require greater cooperation and greater solidarity between states and nations. The maintenance of international peace and security is the foundation and the primary objective behind the creation of the United Nations. Neither indifference nor uh, impetus on its part are therefore acceptable in the face of uh, any threat to international peace and security. At present, the question of international peace and security is crystallizing around the fight against terrorism as well as calming hotbeds of tension in Europe and in Africa. Indeed, terrorism has spared no continent after Asia, Eastern Europe and North America. It is metastasizing in Africa where it has caused conflagration in many places and our continent is paying a heavy price for that in the Sahel, in the east, in the west, in the, in the center and in the south of the continent, terrorists are killing through barbaric exactions against innocent populations and destabilizing states in the name of religious fundamentalism. Some remarkable progress has been made in the Middle East in the fight against this scourge, which is uh, growing, was growing in, in power, but this scourge is far from being extinguished and far from being eradicated from our planet. For that reason, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, one of the African victims of this terrorism, and a member 
of the Global Coalition Against Islamic State calls upon the United Nations to become actively involved in the implementations of the implementation of the recommendations of this coalition and the Aqaba process. Statements of intention and proclamations of faith without any vigorous collective action on the ground will never be enough to eradicate terrorism. Mr. President, at the heart of Europe, the war between Russia and Ukraine is a gaping wound, the blood of which is reaching faraway Africa and disrupting international trade due to significant collateral damage, particularly when it comes to the provision of cereal crops and energy from Ukraine and Russia, which are needed to feed populations and to ensure the functioning of the economies of importer countries. It is essential that the United Nations intervene diligently and more firmly to extinguish this flame with absolute respect for the rules of international law. The Democratic Republic of the Congo supports the position of the African Union and calls on all parties to the conflict to pursue the path of dialogue and law as acknowledged by Africa, which incidentally does have experience in managing security crises provoked by armed groups in some of its states. On this subject, the United Nations know that my country, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, is the victim of an acute security crisis which has lasted more than 20 years in the east of its national territory. Any honest observer speaking in good faith would acknowledge that this crisis is primarily caused by coveting its fabulous natural wealth and the ambition for power of some of its neighbours. The Congolese people acknowledges the involvement of the United Nations, the African Union, African regional communities, the European Union and the foreign bilateral partners of the Democratic Republic of the Congo to curb this recurrent crisis. The DRC and the people of the DRC are grateful to them and we acknowledge the sacrifice of the brave peacekeepers who have lost their lives for the sake of defending the ideals of peace and justice. However, despite tireless internal efforts, a massive UN military presence in the DRC, and diplomatic support for 23 years, this security problem continues to aggrieve my country. In order to eradicate insecurity once and for all, to restore lasting peace, and to ensure stability in the east of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, several agreements were signed with armed groups and even with neighbouring countries under the guarantee of the international community. National and international mechanisms have been created all of these prospects for a lasting settlement of the conflict only lasted for a few months. Very quickly, the architecture of those prospects cracked and the building collapsed. And then we always start again with the same tragedies. Since I was elected to lead the Democratic Republic of the Congo, I have fought tirelessly each day for peace and security in the Congolese provinces of Ituri, North Kivu and South Kivu. Adhering to a philosophy of reconciliation with our neighbours, I spared no effort to assure the heads of state of neighbouring countries and restore confidence between us, particularly through constant consultation on issues of common interest, the conclusion of security cooperation agreements and economic partnership agreements, and the implementation of development projects for our respective populations. 
despite my goodwill and the outstretched hand of the Congolese people for peace, some of our neighbours could find nothing better to do than thank us through aggression and by supporting terrorist arms groups that are ravaging the east of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This is the case currently of Rwanda, which, scorning international law, the UN Charter and the Constitutory Act of the African Union, has once again not only taken aggression in March against the Democratic Republic of the Congo in the form of direct incursions by its armed forces, but also occupies areas in the province of North Kivu via a uh, transplanted armed terrorist group, the 23rd of March movement, the M23, to whom they provide massive support both in fighting materials and also in manpower and troops, and to challenge the international community, the M23, with the support of the Rwandan army, even shot down a Monusco helicopter and killed eight blue helmets, and in so doing committed a war crime. In this emblematic location for international life, I tirelessly denounce this latest act of aggression uh, that my country has fallen victim to by its neighbour Rwanda under cover of a terrorist group called M23. Mr President, the involvement of Rwanda and its responsibility for the tragedy my country is experiencing and the tragedy of my compatriots living in areas occupied by the Rwandan army and their allies from the M23 are no longer in any doubt. Since more than once Groups, panels of experts mandated by the UN and the, joint, the expanded Joint Verification Mission of the International Conference of the Great Lakes Region, uh, as well as international humanitarian non-governmental organizations and human rights organizations have established in documented and objective reports uh, which um, attain the highest standards of academia and science. To dispel any doubt for the community of nations and put an end to the denials of the Rwandan authorities on this subject, the Congolese government asks the President of the Security Council to officially distribute to members of the Council the latest report of the UN group of experts on the security situation in the east of the DRC and to ensure that it is considered diligently by the Council to draw the full consequences from it in the context of international peace and security. It is a question of the very image and credibility of our organization. To do otherwise would on the one hand mean encouraging Rwanda to continue its aggression, its war crimes and its crimes against humanity in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and on the other to further feed legitimate suspicion of the Congolese people when it comes to the impartiality of the UN, as well as the complicity of some of its members in these crimes. It is to bring an end to this suspicion and to dispel the ambiguity of some positions of the Security Council on the security crisis in the east of the DRC, an ambiguity which is frustrating the Congolese population and exacerbating tensions between them and the UN stabilization mission uh, in the DRC, MONUSCO. It's for that reason that my government has asked for a re-evaluation of the progressive responsible withdrawal plan of this mission. This request for adjustment is required by the unanimous agreement, even at the highest levels of our organization, over the regrettable shortcomings of MONUSCO. These shortcomings undoubtedly impact the effectiveness and the legitimacy of the UN's action in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Re-evaluating MONUSCO's withdrawal plan can consequently in no way undermine relations between my country and our organization. Whatever the case may be, I declare loudly from this rostrum at the 
highest international body for the management of the world's affairs, I would like to declare the determination of the Congolese people and of its leaders to always defend to the very last the territorial integrity, independence and sovereignty of their country in respect, of course, of international law and the commitments made within the international organizations that it is a member of. This is also an opportunity for me to clarify that the Congolese state and Congolese civil society will never allow anyone to engage in tribal, ethnic, racial or xenophobic hate speech in our country. The Constitution of the Republic and the laws of the DRC prohibit such speech and punish it severely. Nobody can thus claim that this discourse is happening and use it as a pretext to justify criminal adventures in the DRC, divide the Congolese people and weaken national unity, something that all of my compatriots uh, adhere to fiercely. The DRC is not and will never be a country that commits genocide. What's more? I support the fact that the alleged collaboration that uh, I would say that the alleged collaboration that some Congolese officials may have allegedly with um, Rwandan opponent figures from the Democratic Liberation Forces of Rwanda, the FTLR, which the Rwandan leaders are using to justify their repeated aggression against the DRC, is nothing more than an uh, an alibi, which or an excuse, which is corroborated by no proven information on the ground. The FDLR has been decapitated and reduced to nothing by the armed forces of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the FARDC, in close collaboration with the Rwandan army as part of joint operations conducted a few years ago. The Democratic Republic of the Congo has also repatriated several elements of the FDLR and their families. And so the Congolese people are now asking themselves, what FDLR are we talking about? What size of territory, uh, of occupied Rwandan territory, does this phantom FDLR occupy? What precise part of Rwandan territory has uh, anyone seen a Congolese soldier on? Whatever the case may be, the DRC remains ready to take uh, uh, action against any armed group that attempts to upset peace and security in a neighboring country in the Great Lakes region. Mr. President, the Congolese people ask the United Nations, the African Union, African regional communities and the partners of the DRC to no longer trust the shameful denials of the Rwandan authorities uh, and instead to help rebuild security, build lasting peace and to help create the conditions needed for fruitful cooperation in the Great Lakes region for the well-being of all. To this end, it is necessary to have the following. One, bring about the immediate withdrawal of the M23 from occupied areas the return of displaced Congolese people uh, from these areas to their homes and the unconditional ending of Rwandan army support for this terrorist group. According to the spirit and the letter of the Luanda road map agreed between the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Rwanda, as well as successive statements from the UN Security Council the African Union Peace and Security Council, the uh, East African Community, and the so Southern African Development Community, SADC. Two, increase pressure on Rwanda and the M23, whose leaders are incidentally sanctioned by the UN, and uh, be more firm in respect of those sanctions to ensure that they respect uh, the positions of the aforementioned international organizations. Three, support the continuation of the Nairobi peace process, the Luanda discussions between the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Rwanda, and the deployment 
of the East Africa Regional Force, the statute and the rules of engagement of which have just been signed on the 8th of September in Kinshasa by the Congolese government and the Secretary General of the East African Community on the one hand and on the other by the FARDC and the commanders of this regional force. Four, encourage the um, President of Honorary President of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, and the President of Angola, Joao Lorenzo, mediators from the uh, East African community and the African Union in the security crisis in the Democratic Republic of the Congo to continue their good offices. Five, lift any obstacle to the DRC restructuring its armed forces to increase the power of those armed forces to better carry out their mission, including through the lifting of all restrictive measures limiting their acquisition of military equipment, regardless the, of the form uh, laid out by the UN Security Council. Carrying out the aforementioned actions would undoubtedly ensure that the Congolese people would be certain of a settlement to the crisis and would facilitate constructive dialogue among all of the parties concerned about that settlement. Mr. President, we, the Congolese people, are now determined once and for all to put an end to insecurity in the east of our country, whatever the cost. The time has come to once and for all break the infernal cycle of violence in the east of the Democratic Republic of the Congo to stabilize the Great Lakes region so as to benefit as much as possible from its economic potential as well as from its rich biodiversity to save humanity in the face of climate change. Managing these changes raises two fundamental problems, namely the implementation of legal and financial instruments stemming from international negotiations, in particular in the context of the various conferences of the parties to the United Nations Framework Agreement on Climate Change, current Convention on Climate Change, and the energy transition. It is time on the one hand to put an end to the selective implementation of commitments made by polluters and on the other hand to uh, compensate in the name of climate justice the efforts made by less polluting countries including those in Africa to preserve the environment in the interests of our entire planet. As for the energy transition, Africa has a sufficient wealth of renewable energy sources and raw materials which could help mobilize credible alternatives to the double energy and environmental crises. From this point of view, it is important to note that the Democratic Republic of the Congo is among the primary producers of essential strategic uh, minerals for the energy transition and for decarbonisation in the transport sector, including cobalt, lithium, nickel and manganese. My country has set itself the goal of producing these precious metals cleanly to this end. And it is with this in mind that the Republic of Zambia and the Democratic Republic of the Congo on the 29th of April signed an agreement on the establishment of a value chain in the electric battery and clean energy sector. It goes without saying, given the importance of um, of the size of the investments required by the implementation of such a project that the involvement of partners is particularly essential, particularly in terms of providing capital and appropriate te technologies. What's more, in order to support the green transformation program of economies on the African continent and to meet the growing energy demand around the world, my country has chosen to make the most of its vast potential in renewable energy sources, including hydroelectricity, 
solar energy, geothermal energy, and the exploitation of its gas deposits. The Democratic Republic of the Congo is an asset when it comes to implementing the 2063 Agenda of the African Union through the implementation of the Grand Inga project, which could also be beneficial for part of Europe and the Middle East. It is with this in mind that we are delighted to host the preparatory work for the 27th Conference of the Parties, pre-COP27, which will take place in Kinshasa next month. Mr. President, I would like to take this opportunity to shed some light on the environmental aspect of the tender launched on the 28th of July by my country for the exploration of 27 oil deposits and three gas deposits, a call which has been um, um, unhelpfully criticized in the international arena. Here, it is worth recalling that no relevant international legal instrument ratified by the Democratic Republic of the Congo prohibits it from exploiting its natural resources for reasons of protecting the environment or for fear of aggravating global warming. Next, the 2015 Paris Agreement recognises that developing countries have the right to emit CO2 for their development while taking precautions for the global climate through their nationally determined contributions. The government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo has thus set itself the goal of exploiting the country's natural resources while respecting environmental standards and processing them locally to provide extra added value and to boost the national economy, including by creating liquid uh, wealth, cash and jobs to improve the living conditions of the Congolese population. The appropriate strategies and measures have been adopted to avoid negative impacts on the environment. Like other countries in Africa and Europe that have overcome this challenge, they involve effective government checks and balances. For the Democratic Republic of the Congo, it is a question of achieving its economic and social goals whilst also preserving its forests and continuing to be a solution country when it comes to the fight against global warming. My country remains open to cooperation with any partner that would like to help it achieve its goals. On the economic front, what needs to be done is to help economies recover, the economies of countries that have been weakened by the collateral effects of climate change and the coronavirus, to promote balanced global economic growth and to halt the exacerbation of poverty in developing countries. We cannot overcome this challenge without internal good governance efforts at the national level, nor productive investments of capital, nor without real and sufficient transfers of financial resources to those who need them. For that reason, the Democratic Republic of the Congo calls for the proposal for rich countries to cede a percentage of their special drawing rights at the International Monetary Fund to less well-off countries to be fleshed out. This was a proposal made by the Paris Conference on the relaunch of economies post-COVID-19 in May 2021. It was supported by a firm commitment from the G20 summit in October 2021 in Rome. In any case, any facility for access to additional resources for those countries sorely tested by climate change and COVID-19 would be welcome. Similarly, alleviating the debt burden of low-income countries must continue to be a constant concern which should be included 
in a global approach of international solidarity. For its part, despite the difficult global economic situation following the harmful effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo has made remarkable progress in economic growth. Wealth creation accelerated in 2021, particularly thanks to the dynamism of the mining sector. Production growth in that sector went from 1% in 2019 to 10.1% in 2021, following the good uh, price of copper and cobalt on the international markets. Inflation and the exchange rate of the Congolese franc have remained relatively stable. The Administrative Board of the International Monetary Fund therefore concluded favourably the second review of the programme supported by the Extended Credit Facility. The IMF expressed its satisfaction with the prudent macroeconomic policies adopted by the government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We will tirelessly continue these policies and the effort to improve the business climate which is currently underway to promote private investment and to promote economic activities in general. Mr President, solidarity and justice in relations between nations have always been factors in mutual peace and security because they bring people together and create links of interdependence between them. Therefore, the fight against poverty and promoting collective well-being are powerful sources that we can draw on to combat social conflicts and tensions between peoples. For that reason, the DRC welcomes the collective action of the international community against COVID-19 and commends the initiative of the United States of America, New Feed the Future, to finance agriculture in order to combat hunger and food insecurity in Africa following the Russo-Ukrainian crisis. And my country, the DRC, is among those African beneficiary countries, just to mention these most recent cases. My country calls for similar actions and initiatives which not only help resolve problems of surviving on a daily basis and help create accessible jobs for a large number of people, but also help distribute uh, incomes and purchasing power. However, in the name of international solidarity and justice, we do have questions over the maintenance of sanctions against the people of Zimbabwe. These are sanctions which, what's more, date back to the era of the late President Robert Mugabe. Why is our organisation so silent and so indifferent to this injustice, almost a crime, against an innocent people? As the current president of the Southern African Development Community, SADC, I firmly call upon the United Nations to do everything possible to achieve the immediate lifting of sanctions against the Republic of Zimbabwe and its people. Mr. President, in this multipolar world, no country, however powerful and rich they are, can aim to overcome the challenges that I have just mentioned uh, alone, let alone overcome them in the interests of everyone. The importance of what is at stake, the complexity of the problems that need to be resolved and the scale of the task require an equitable multilateral approach which includes the interests of each and every one and which pools the energy of everyone in a climate of mutual respect. For that reason, the Democratic Republic of the Congo continues to think that it is essential that we better structure multilateralism and enrich it with equal treatment for all of the 
parties involved in order to create spaces for dialogue and cooperation, which is something that we need in order to ensure international peace and security. That is the United Nations that we want. To do this, we need to act urgently to reform the UN, which seems to be lagging somewhat at the moment. In this context, I would like to stress the need to satisfy the legitimate and just claim of Africa to be represented on the UN Security Council with two additional seats in the category of the non-permanent members and two others from among the permanent members with the same rights, including the veto, the same privileges and obligations of the current permanent members. This is a question of justice that needs to be done to a continent, or indeed to an entire swath of humanity whose role continues to grow with each day that passes in the conduct of international affairs. We Africans are firmly attached to that. Mr. President of the United Nations General Assembly, Mr. Secretary General of the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, heads of state and government, ladies and gentlemen, heads of delegation, to conclude, allow me to say a few words about gender equality. There is a need here to stress the need to continue current efforts at the international level and within states to create spaces of gender equality and opportunities for liberty and action for women. In order to do this, the involvement of men in gender-forward policies is necessary because, on the one hand, men share their lives with women, and on the other hand, since time immemorial, for various reasons, men have established a preeminence over women which gives them a determining influence over the destiny, the fate of women. We must bring an end to this de facto situation. That is why, during my term at the head of the African Union, I initiated a meeting of heads of state and government of the Continental Organization under the subject Conference of Men on Positive Masculinity. This historic meeting, held in Kinshasa in 2021, led to an African Union declaration containing commitments of men, including heads of state and government, to put an end to violence against women and girls and to provide appropriate responses to this issue. This declaration constitutes a veritable African Union charter for women, which I am working hard to make a reality as uh, in my role as African Union champion for positive masculinity. It's in this context that I have decided to further promote the Congolese woman who today increasingly occupies the foreground in the management of public affairs within political, legal and administrative institutions in my country. This proactive policy should in the future allow for radical change, not only a change in the perception of women and the role of women in society, but also in women taking charge of their own destinies. Because equality is not a gift given to women, but rather a responsibility that they must shoulder. I wish every success to the work of the 77th session of the General Assembly. Thank you. In nombre de la Asamblea, deseo agradecer al presidente de la On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address.